we're in chapter 10 in Hebrews. Let's begin reading together at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 10, and we'll get into our study. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10. The writer writes, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? If the worshipers, once purged, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in, in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. And then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, as we get into our study, I'm going to be giving you some background in a few minutes, but I need to um, remind you that in the Old Testament, animal sacrifice was an extremely important ritual. And the Jews would offer the blood or flesh of an animal as an offering uh, for their sins. So as we begin, he's making the point no animal could ever satisfy the righteous demands of God. And the reason no animal sacrifice could do so is because the law had only a shadow, he says, of the good things to come. Now notice in verse 1 how he says that, the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. And so the law only had a shadow. That word shadow speaks of a pale outline or a sketch. And the point he's making is animal sacrifices only pointed to what God would ultimately accomplish through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. When you consider animal sacrifice as part of, uh, part of the Old Testament and obviously as part of the law that God gave through Moses, you might uh, find it interesting to note that animal sacrifice actually didn't begin in uh, the book of Exodus with, uh, with Moses delivering the law, but actually predates that. Animal sacrifice goes all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 3. You see, the covering of sin through uh, animal sacrifice actually began in the Garden of Eden because after the fall, the Bible makes it clear that God himself provided an offering on their behalf in order to cover their sin. You see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Now, in Genesis 3, 21, it says, Adam and his wife, for Adam and his wife, the Lord made, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So, we know the story. We know that how that God had given a command to Adam and Eve and said, do not eat of the fruit, because in the day they eat of this particular fruit, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. We know that Eve took of it through uh, being beguiled by the serpent, and we also know that she gave unto her husband, and he did eat also. And their eyes were opened up, and they knew the difference between, and ex by experience, knew good and evil. As a result of that, we know that God entered into the scene, and he began to speak to them, and he cursed the earth, and he cursed a man, he cursed a woman, and uh, he cursed the serpent. And uh, yet, when you read chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, you don't find any indication there that any animal had yet to die. See, Adam and Eve entered into sin, and thus death follows as a result of that. So we know that when we get to chapter 3, verse 21, when the Scripture says that the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them, we know that it was the Lord God who initiated this and that God himself uh, took the life of the animals, if you will, in order that he might clothe those who had fallen. We know that the idea for uh, uh, sacrifice to cover sin did not originate with Adam. It had to originate with God. And so God is the one who initiated this. The very first death that took place in the world, therefore, was a death that would be a type or a prefigurement 
of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who would die for us and would cover our sins. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 1, the apostle says at verse 20 that Jesus indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Revelation 13, 8 speaks of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the very first death that took place in the world was a type of Jesus' death, which was still obviously yet future. But when the Lord had that, initiated that sacrifice, you see it later on. You see it continuing from that point on. Another example would be in Genesis chapter 8, for example. We have Noah. We have Noah leaving the ark after he's been in the ark for about a year. And as he leaves the ark, according to Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean beast, of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And so we see a sacrifice taking place in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell. We see it later on after God judged. And you continue to see this pattern in the Old Testament book of Genesis. One of the most interesting pictures you find is found in Genesis in chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, we have a picture there, a picture of Abram who is about to sacrifice his son Isaac. And in that sacrifice, or willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac, you see a picture of what the Lord God would ultimately accomplish through his son Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 22, God spoke to uh, Abraham and said to him, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to take him to Moriah in the place that I've appointed for him, and I want you to sacrifice him there for me. The Bible tells us that Abraham took some wood, he took some fire, and he took his son, he spoke to the servants, and he said to them, I'm going to be returning, um, the lad and I will return to you. But he took off, he went with the son. As he went with the son, he uh, took some wood, placed it on his son uh, Isaac. He took the fire and all. And Isaac, looking at his son, uh, or rather his father says to him, uh, I see the wood and I see the fire. But he says, but where is the, where is the sacrifice? Where's the offering? Can you imagine for just a moment what Abraham was thinking as he was looking back into the eyes of his son? knowing that God had commanded him to take his son, his only son, and to offer him in the place that God had appointed. And as he's looking at his, his beloved son, Isaac, the one who was laughter to his heart, he said, God himself will provide a lamb. And uh, actually, God will, God will provide a lamb who is himself, literally. In other words, God has already gotten this taken care of. He's going to do something. And that, of course, was yet future but it was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who carried the wood on his own body and ultimately was sacrificed. Even though, even though Abraham did not fulfill that, as a matter of fact, the Lord stopped him from doing it. It says in Genesis 22, verses 9 through 14, they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in, in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And uh, Abraham stretched forth his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And so God has given to us pictures of sacrifice all through the Old Testament up to the time of the law. When God gave the law to Moses, he gave to Moses various offerings that Moses was to, was to make to God, the people of Israel to make to God. Let me give you a couple of these things because all of this develops a context so we can understand Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, first, there was a burnt offering. This burnt offering is an offering that is totally consumed before the Lord, and it's a picture for us of Jesus' atoning death for sinners. You see that in Le Leviticus chapter 4, verse 29, and you see it basically fulfilled in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, when the Bible says that he has made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you had the burnt offering. You also have the grain offering. The grain offering is symbolic of offering your best fruit to the living God. You find that in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 4. And the Bible tells us in Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. 
You see the peace offering. The peace offering is also called, called a fellowship offering, and that symbolizes restored fellowship with God. You see, sin makes a separation between God and man. Sin always separates. It'll separate my fellowship with God. It separates my fellowship with other people. Sin always does that. And until that sin is dealt with, until confession and repentance and, and forsaking that sin occurs, then I'm going to have broken fellowship. I have broken fellowship with God, and I'll have broken fellowship with people. I mean, I can't get in an argument with my wife and think that everything's going to be okay later on if I don't make peace with her. Peace offerings usually jewelry. But anyway, you offer peace offerings, and that symbolizes restored fellowship with God. You see that in Leviticus chapter 3, and you also see that fulfilled in Romans chapter 5 because we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we've been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And so you also had what was called a sin offering. That's found in Leviticus chapter 4 and uh, fulfilled by Jesus Christ who was offered up for us. So all of these offerings, if you took time and if we were to take time to look at them closely, were actually a foreshadowing of what God would accomplish through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He brings us peace through Him. He brings to us a, a, an offering for sin through Him. And so we can have a relationship with Him and it's fulfilled. But in the Old Testament, what would happen is you would have these, these uh, offerings made continually, some of them year by year. And so it says in verse 1 here in chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. So they continually are offered. Now he's speaking of the day of atonement. They had done that. They had sacrificed and they had celebrated this particular day, the day of atonement for centuries. And yet... Every offering they had made, no matter how much blood that they had offered, was not perfect enough to atone for their sin. There needed to be something that was done that was perfect, and that perfect sacrifice came through Jesus Christ. So you see in verse 2, he goes on to say, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purged, would have had no more consciousness of sins. In those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. When you commit your heart to Christ, you can actually put your head on your pillow that night and you can sleep with the knowledge that your sin has been completely forgiven. I can remember when I gave my heart to Christ, I can remember coming home and for the first time that I could remember putting my head on the pillow that night and sleeping in peace knowing that my sin question had finally been answered through Jesus Christ. And my conscience was now being purged, and I also had a sense of newness of life. In the Old Testament, you had Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Every year, offering would be made for your sin. And in the offering every year was a constant reminder. I needed a sacrifice. I need a sacrifice in order to cover my sin, but not with Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross one time for all time, that was for us. He is not to be re-sacrificed. There's no necessity for future sacrifices. It's all been accomplished through Him, one time for all time. In the Old Testament, there's a reminder of my sin on a yearly basis when Yom Kippur is being celebrated. In the New Testament, I have this, this awareness that the sin question has been answered through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice what he says. He says in verse 4, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. You see, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, there's no more awareness of a need for forgiveness. Jesus Christ, through his blood, has washed me clean. And God washes us from sin, and not only from sin, but he also washes us from its power over us. Uh, one of the things that we need to understand, and this is really an important thing, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to communicate this properly, but one of the things that we need to understand is that we come to Christ. When you come to Christ, you actually receive something that you didn't have before. And for some of you, this may be a new thought, but it's actually extremely biblical and especially very important to us. You now 
have the ability to say no to sin. Prior to that, prior to coming to Christ, I had really no strength within me to be able to consistently and constantly reject the temptations that were thrown my way. Because by, by nature, I was already attracted to the things that were taking me away from God, and it was much easier to do those things. When I got saved, God gave to me a supply of His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now dwells within me. And now, according to Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I have the ability in Jesus Christ to say no to sin. I have an ability to flee. I have an ability to have victory because all of this has been won for me in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans, in chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, Paul said it like this. He said, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this, not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. He says in verse 19 of chapter 5 of Romans, just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And so I have the ability now, because I have the power of the Spirit within me, to say no to sin. I have the ability to say, no, I'm not going to yield to that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's given me His Holy Spirit, enabling me to do that. I do that because the salvation that I've received is an accomplished fact that occurred 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. And he sends his Holy Spirit to those who believe. The Spirit indwells us, and we now have the ability to go forward. So instead of having a constant reminder of what we've been, we can now look at Scripture that teaches us if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so what I do is I, I identify with the finished work of Christ. And so I can wake up in the morning and I can say unto the Lord, I can say, thank you for the new day that you're going to give to me opportunities in. And Lord, I pray that you give me the strength to be victorious today, to serve you and to live for you. Because you give to me through the power of your spirit and the word of God, the ability to have a, a, a freedom from the power of sin in my life. And so the blood of bulls and goats were unable to do that for me because in their offering, because they're insufficient, they're not perfect and they're only animals, I don't have the ability to have a complete freedom. But in Christ, I do, because Jesus took upon himself my sin in enabling me to have relationship with him. So the sac sacrifice of animals were only types, because an animal can't cleanse you. But Jesus, as God in human flesh, is the one who completely satisfies, and he's the one who completely cleanses. So in verse 5, continuing, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you didn't desire but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And so notice with me, this is not some radical departure from Orthodox Jewish belief. This is Old Testament. He quotes out of the Psalms when he, when he uh, in verses 5 through 7, quotes this. This is actually found in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. I do find something interesting, though, and I want to note this with you. Notice when in verse 5 as he begins, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. When you cross-reference this with, with Psalm 40, uh, verse 6 this, uh, through 8, this is what the Psalm says. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Now, David is the guy, is the man who wrote Psalm 40. And David knew that God desires more than, uh, much more than ritual religion. David knew that God desires our heart. And so God had opened his ears to hear this. In doing so, he gave him ears to hear as well as the ability to do. So God's desire for us is to obey him. And, and we can know what he desires from us because what he desires is revealed in Scripture. And so to obey requires that we open our ears to hear what he says 
and to delight in Him. So my desire as a New Testament believer ought to be to follow the pattern of Christ. And Jesus Christ's desire was to do that which His Father called Him to do. You see, in verse 8, uh, He had said in uh, Psalm 40, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. So commitment to God's revealed by a desire to conform your life to His will. Now, I realize that, um, and I've been thinking about this lately, so I might as well share it with you. I realize that you can come to um, Bible studies like this, and you can hear a message of exhortation coming out where you hear me say, man, we can do it. Let's go for it. Let's see what the Lord does. You know, don't give yourself over to the enemy. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. Uh, but the bottom line is this. I, I know that, that even though I might have a great desire to do all the things that God calls me to do, that I'm going to fail. I realize that, and I do that every day. I, I fail in thought. I, I fail in word. I, I fail in action. I, I, I do. Uh, Though you and though I may have a desire to live a life that is, is just right before God and, 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 and free from the presence of sin, the fact of the matter is, is uh, even the Apostle Paul, when he uh, was, was uh, speaking concerning his own testimony, even the Apostle Paul had stated uh, that he had yet to apprehend that which he had been apprehended for. In other words, I haven't, I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived. I haven't made it there. I wouldn't want you to beat yourself up trying to be perfect, is what I'm trying to say. What I want us to do is just trust in the one who is perfect. Uh, all I'm trying to do is encourage you to know what has already been done for you. It's been done through Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, you have God initiating sacrifice. Keep this in mind. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it was not Adam initiating some way to get close to God. Remember that with me. It wasn't Adam doing that. The Bible says that he had fashioned fig leaves, hidden, hidden his nakedness behind some, some uh, man-made uh, man, uh, works, if you will, and was trying to hide his own sinful nakedness. And the Bible also says that he heard the voice of the Lord God in the garden. And what that speaks of is that Adam knew that the Lord was approaching him, and he hid himself from the Lord. And it's the voice of God that you find in Genesis 3 when God calls out and says, Adam, where are you? There's not an indication there, in other words, that Adam was seeking for the Lord. The indication is that God was seeking for Adam. And not only was God seeking for Adam, but through the calling out of Adam's name, it was God attempting to retrieve him. And when God said to Adam, Adam, where are you? That was an opportunity for Adam to say, I have taken of the forbidden fruit, I have fallen. But he didn't do that. What he did is he fashioned something to hide behind and didn't even admit when confronted by God. And so all through the Bible, you see God seeking us out. You don't see Adam failing and then running into the arms of God saying, forgive me. What you see in the Bible is Adam failing and hiding from the presence of God. And that's why it's important to note that when God covered them with the skins of animals, those animals did not die. God killed them because that's a picture of the fact that in the future, his own son would actually be voluntarily yielded up on a cross so that he could take the penalty because God had said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. God, in other words, all the way back in the garden had stated to them that the wages of sin is death. But even though God was a just judge, He at the same time is merciful. He actually seeks out the ones who fell and then makes provision for them and actually covers them with the skins. In the Old Testament, we are covered in a sense. The Old Testament saints were covered in a sense but not completely because there was a yearly offering on Yom Kippur as a reminder that they had still failed to have a, a, a continual relationship with God. But in the New Testament, what you have through Jesus Christ is a one-time for all-time sacrifice. So the day you committed your heart to Christ and said yes to Jesus Christ and said, God, forgive me a sinner, God cleansed you completely of all your sin. And now he gives to you the power to be able to overcome 
temptation as it does approach your life in order that you through Christ can have the victory. And so when Jesus Christ came, Jesus made it clear here in verse 5 that sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but a body you prepared for me. Jesus was speaking concerning the fact that he uh, was going to be the one who was offered. Uh, animal sacrifice and, and grain offerings was not, were not satisfying. They were inadequate. So you have prepared a body for me. And so he's speaking concerning the fact that he's going to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ voluntarily laid his life down. When the question is asked, who killed Jesus Christ, you have some who say the Jews, you have others who say the Romans. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. Jesus voluntarily laid his life down for us one time and all, for all time. And this body that was prepared for him is the body that he received from his mother Mary. And so this body that he's speaking about was his human flesh. The Bible says to us in verse uh, 7, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Well, Jesus Christ came in order that he might fulfill the perfect will of his Father. Do you remember how that, on one occasion, the Lord was speaking, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. And Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to die. And his beloved apostle Peter said, let this thing be far from you, Lord, that you should die. Peter didn't desire Jesus Christ to die. As a matter of fact, Peter wanted to uh, discourage Jesus Christ from doing that which his father had called him to do. But he had come to do the will of his father. And that's what he's saying here in verse 7. I have come to do thy will, O God. Jesus knew that he had come with the express purpose, in other words, of laying down his life for our sin. He knew that. It wasn't a secret to him. In Luke chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus said it this way. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I greatly desire it to be accomplished. I have an internal desire and drive to embrace the cross, because in doing so, I'm going to be able to sacrifice my life and save yours. And so that's my great desire. I will embrace that. I'm not hiding from it. I have come to do the will of my Father. And in doing so, I'm going to bring great pleasure and many sons to glory. He says in verse 8, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so notice verse 8. Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you do not desire. To show believers, the Jewish believers, that, that, he was, that, that these sacrifices were not completely satisfactory, we need to look at Jesus Christ. Their offerings were not intended to be permanent, so they could not be complete. They could not satisfy completely. So he says in verse 9, I have come to do your will. The new has come through Jesus Christ, and that's the superior covenant because that covenant is written on their hearts. What I love about the Lord is that he gives me the will and the ability to perform that which I desire. He puts inside of you both the mental desire to do that which is right. God puts that. How does he do that? Well, he writes on the tablets of your human heart his word. That comes through reading the word, memorizing it, meditating on it, acting on it. And so as you read the Bible, and it doesn't, it's not always the most entertaining thing, I have to confess, and you know that already as you read it. There are some passages that you read, and they're very adventurous and very exciting, and there are others that are long lists of names and things that aren't the most exciting thing that you've ever read. But as you read through the Word of God, and you begin to say, God, open my eyes, and be behold wondrous things from your law. Uh, open my eyes, open my heart, open my ears that I might hear what the Spirit says. And Father, I ask also that as I study your word, that you would allow your word to study me so that when I look at the mirror of your word, I can see the life that I'm living. And as I compare my life with what you say, that I might be able to line up with what your word says because I want to live in such a way that I give pleasure to you. And so you do that. You read the Bible, and as you read the Bible, God reveals his heart to you, and he begins to write on the tablets of your heart his desires. 
and he begins to etch in your, in, your, in your heart his word. And so he has given to you his word. He also gives to you the will to perform that. For the will has been given to us uh, by the Lord. Paul makes that clear in the book of Philippians. And so he gives us the will to do that. But he also gives to us the ability to do that by the power of his Holy Spirit. God never, in other words, gives to you any command that he also does not give to you the power to obey and to perform. And so that comes through uh, receiving Christ. And so we have the power of the Holy Spirit and new desires that have implant, been implanted uh, by him. And so when he said, said in verse 9, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It was God's will for Jesus to be his final and perfect sacrifice for sin, and his death has forever set us apart for God to be used by him. And his sacrifice has made us sanctified or set apart for God, and that means that we daily can live for Jesus Christ. And that's all I really want to do, is I want to learn how to live for Jesus Christ daily. That's really what it's all about. It's not always easy. Sometimes it can be extremely difficult. You know, I lost my luggage. I don't know if I've told you. Perhaps I already did. When we went to Spain, we were on our way home, and we got in the airport there in Malaga, and um, we had a, a layover in London, and then from London, we flew on home. It was an 11-hour 11, 11 flight from London to uh, LAX, and so when we got into LAX, uh, we went to the carousel there and waited for our bags to come out, and there were hundreds and hundreds of bags, you know, luggage coming around in that carousel, and and we stood there for a good 30 minutes, and, and I couldn't find my bag at all. And so I walked up to one of the guys there who works there, and at first I was pretty frustrated, to be honest with you, and I said, I can't find my bag. I said, well, where do you think it is? And he says, oh, I don't know how would I know. And um, I wasn't happy about that, but he was right. And so I, I went home. And uh, as I went home, I was not a happy camper. And so we gave a call. We gave a call to uh, one of my secretaries and uh, said, uh, by the way, do you know where the bag is? And they said, uh, nope. And so we did that for several days. I mean, like seven, eight days, nine days. And finally, we found out where it was. My bag went to Australia. Now, I've never been to Australia, but my bag has. <laughs> and I have to tell you, man, I was like real frustrated. And it had, it had things in it that were important to me. My Bible that I've been teaching since 1988, my Bible since I've been teaching out of for all of those years, that had been, one of my sons has already claimed it, has already said, Daddy, when you die, is that a, is that a wish of some sort? I mean, but he said, Daddy, when you die, Pop, when you die, I want that Bible. And so I had my Bible in there. I had some inexpensive souvenirs, frankly, that I bought for the kids and for Marie. But to, to me, it was just an idea that I had spent some time thinking of them, and I wanted to give them these little things and all. There was just a lot of uh, things like that going on in my head. And, and at the very end of it, we get a phone call, and um, they say, we found your bag. It was on Australia, and we'll be bringing it in tomorrow. And the Lord, through that, just revealed something to me that I really didn't like seeing. He, he revealed to me how carnal uh, everybody else is, and I'm not. No, he... he, he <laughs> He revealed how carnal I am, you know, how I can get upset and, 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 and how I can have a flesh. And every day I'm thinking, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And it was just a reminder to me. You know, I got to the point where I, I told my secretary, I said, you know what? To be honest with you, I think somebody, uh, you know, took the stuff. I just think that they, they ripped it off. It's a small bag. It's something I could have put on the, uh, on the plane and I didn't. And she looks at me, my secretary uh, this last Tuesday, and she says, I'm praying that God is going to bring that bag. And I looked at her, and I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, don't even pray, man. Some jerk's wearing my shoes right now. You know that. <laughs> oh, me of little faith. Because she calls me up, you know, and she says, I just want you to know that the bag was found. And I heard that little, like, I told you so. So I said, I just want you to know you're fired. No, um... <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. I need a Savior. I need somebody who's perfect because God knows I'm not. I need somebody who, who cares for me because he cares for me in the right way, and me, I just care for me, period. 
So I need somebody to help me die to me. And somebody who's a great model of doing that and who will also give me the power to do that. And I need somebody who is totally sufficient. That's Jesus Christ. Because when it says here in verse 10 that uh, by, by that will we have been sanctified or set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, I like to note that it's once for all. Jesus does not have to be re-sacrificed. Jesus Christ's blood was the perfect offering. His life was the perfect offering for us. And because of that, we can have life through him. So if you're trying to make yourself into something good, you might as well give up. You can't. What you need is somebody who is good, and that's Jesus. And that's what it means to yield ourselves to him because he's the only one who can perform the things that we desire to do. And so I trust him because he died for me one time for all time so that I can have a relationship with him for eternity. That comes through Jesus Christ.